This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. Lectures in History joins students in the classroom to hear lectures on campuses across the country. This week, Utah State University professor Maria Angela Diaz teaches a class on the Civil War in the West, looking at conflict in states and territories such as Missouri, Kansas, Texas, and Arizona. Okay, so uh, today we are in, uh, talking about the Civil War in the West. Um, and before we do get started, I uh, just want to say a reminder that on Thursday, we're going to continue talking about the Civil War in the West. We're doing it all week long. And um, on Thursday, we're going to be talking about the Andrew Massick book, which is uh, Civil War in the Southwest, Borderlands. So I am trusting that, like me, you all have studiously read the book the entire semester and taken deep notes and are ready to talk about it on Thursday. Uh, but today what we are going to be talking about is um, two borders. So our week, is it week 12? Yeah, let's go ahead and say it's week 12. Um, our, week to, our week 12 learning objectives, uh, to explore the differences in the, in, uh, the experiences of the border states and what uh, many historians call the borderlands. And then to understand how the war affected Native Americans and to understand Confederate and Union interests in the Far West. And we're going to kind of hit all three of these a little bit today, um, but we'll be dealing with all three of these learning objectives throughout the entire week. So let us begin. All right. So first, this is like there is more than one border. This is like my reason for doing research, historical research, and also for teaching Um, Civil War era Southern history especially, is to remind people that um, there are the border states and there is the border lands. And I also, I put this up here to remind us of the different theaters that we've been looking at over the course of the semester. The Eastern Theater, this is roughly how they break up, Eastern Theater, Western Theater, and the Trans-Mississippi. Up until now, we've spent most of our time, the majority of it, in the Eastern Theater and then in the Western Theater a little bit. We haven't really talked quite as much about the Trans-Mississippi Theater. And ultimately, the Trans-Mississippi is kind of everything west of the Mississippi River. And um, we're going to be talking about that, but we're also going to be going into the far, far west where we are and then also a little bit into California because both the Confederacy and the Union are not just interested in maintaining their, are not just interested in sort of competing over this space, which is the Confederacy, but they're also interested in eventually gaining control of this space. We go back to westward expansion, right? Like, this is for all the money, like, to control what is west of the Mississippi River. Um, so far as, as what I mean by there is more than one border is that these are typically, the, these are like it says the border states. And so this is the border between what? The Union and the South, the North and South, the Union and the Confederacy. These are, Confeder- are Confederate states. They're, well, they're not really Confederate states, but it's complicated, as we'll see. This is not one. But these are slave states. These are slave states, right? And then these are... Union states, and then this is unorganized territory. These are just territories. They're not states, like it says during the Civil War. Um, And so within the border states, what you have here is is a war that doesn't look like what we see in the Eastern Theater, right? So the Eastern Theater is like big, fancy battles, Gettysburg and Antietam and all those other battles, and the big, fancy armies, the Army of the Potomac, the Army of Northern Virginia, and Robert E. Lee, and Ulysses S. Grant, and all of these people fighting it out. And that's mostly what Americans think when they think about the Civil War. And we have done a pretty good job, I think, and at least nod your heads, everybody else. Um, <laughs> we've done a pretty good job kind of mixing that up and kind of uh, t- realizing how complicated that actually is and that that's not wholly what's going on there. But the Western theater, also big fancy battles, big fancy armies, but a lot of division and a lot of complicated stuff going on. Trans-Mississippi theater, border states and the border lands. The war looks a little different here. You don't have as many of the big fancy armies and the big fancy battles. You have much more what they call guerrilla warfare or irregular warfare, um, especially up in the yellow part. 
up in the border states. Now, there are historians who, re who recognize that forms of irregular warfare take place kind of throughout the Confederacy, um, but the most explosive and certainly most famous parts uh, of this sort of guerrilla warfare takes place, especially in Missouri and Kansas, which is where we're going to be spending sort of half of the class. And in the borderlands, and also this is this uh, this here, which is Oklahoma, is Indian territory. That's unorganized territory um, where Native Americans from largely the southeast are forced to go. That's during in the 1830s during the Trail of Tears and a lot of those, uh, frankly, expulsions from their native lands in the southeast wind up in, in Indian territory. And along the Gulf Coast and into the borderlands and into Texas here, the population looks different. Um, it's a much more diverse population, ethnically, racially. You guys have been reading about this um, in the Southwest Borderlands book. You have, even in the Gulf Coast area, you have uh, populations of what they call French and Spanish Creoles. Um, these are descendants of French and Spanish settlers um, and conquerors, frankly, that lived in a lot of the cities of the Gulf Coast, but you also have immigrants, German immigrants. Um, there are thousands of German immigrants that moved to Texas in the antebellum period, but also French immigrants, Polish immigrants who make their home there. And you have in the Southwest very strong um, Native American peoples like the Comanche, the Apache, um, that also um, control vast amounts of this territory. And then, of course, you have about 100,000 um, Mexicans living in the entirety of this sort of western half of the United States and in Texas. You also have other Hispanics or other Spanish-speaking people, people of Spanish descent, in the Gulf Coast, Cubans, Puerto Ricans. There are uh, Cuban neighborhoods in New Orleans, for instance, um, that... Uh, are also similar to Cuban and Hispanic neighborhoods in, uh, in New York City. Um, and they are mostly exiles from, uh, from the island of Cuba, which is under control of Spain. So there's a lot going on. Once the further we go west, the further we go down south, there is a lot of complicated ethnic, racial, um, and class divisions that the Civil War affects and that also affect the Civil War in the southwest borderlands and also in the border states. So this is where we're going to spend our time today. All right, first, we are headed to the border states. Um, this is, uh, so guerrilla warfare has kind of become like this big flashy thing. So we are very much today on like the cutting edge of Civil War history, you guys, right now, today, in your papers that you are writing studiously for the rest of the semester. We are, we're very much cutting edge Civil War history. I'm going to flip through my notes. All right. So, the conflict as it manifests in Kansas and Missouri. We have already seen conflict in Kansas and Missouri. What is that conflict? Bleeding Kansas. Bleeding Kansas. Yes, Bleeding Kansas. Starts roughly about 1854 goes here and there with some explosive violent events up into 1861. And the way that the Civil War manifests in Kansas and Missouri is very much connected to that bleeding Kansas conflict that um, some people think, you know, is sort of like the war before the war. And so the Kansas-Missouri conflict, as some historians call, say, is it becomes a war within a war. But that's actually going to be true of the borderlands as well. There are many conflicts within the larger conflict of, uh, of the American Civil War. And so um, the way that it begins in Kansas and Missouri uh, happens in 1861. Um, as soon as the Civil War breaks out, guerrilla warfare emerges as the sort of popular alternative to enlistment in the Confederate Army. If you enlist in the Confederate Army, you may not be fighting in your home state. You may not be fighting in your home community. You may be sent um, with your brigade to fight in other parts of the South. And so for some men who don't want to necessarily do that, who don't want to leave their communities or leave their families, perhaps defenseless, um, this sort of guerrilla warfare, these, sort of, uh, these, these guerrilla groups become a popular alternative 
to um, formerly enlisting in the Confederate Army. So far as Missouri's status during the Civil War, uh, it's kind of similar to Kentucky's, which is sort of like, uh, we kind of are for the Confederacy, but kind of not for the Confederacy. So Missouri... um, doesn't have like this formal seceding thing that happens in a lot of the other states that we've talked about uh, when it comes to the Confederacy. Eventually what they're going to have is a pro-union government and then uh, a pro-Confederate government that's operating in exile. And that happens in Kentucky as well. So the populace of Missouri, some people might be unionists, some people might be Confederates or Confederate sympathizers. Um, and then on the other side of Kansas, it's somewhat similar, uh, but they're mostly, mostly going to be unionists in, in Kansas. So what winds up happening is with these guerrilla fighters, they're, they're still in their communities. They don't oftentimes have uniforms. Um, it's the bushwhackers that are the ones that, that are not affiliated straight up with the Confederacy. They're there to protect Missouri. They're there to protect their communities. That's at least what they're saying. Um, other people are calling them bandits, criminals, murderers. And uh, they do, you know, the war, the guerrilla war is, is an extremely violent, personal, bloody war in a way that you don't see on the big fancy battlefields. Um, these are communities against each other. It sometimes even devolves into people, individual people against each other. The Union Army is trying to deal with this, but any of you who have studied a war where you have uh, guerrilla fighters, it's, it can be difficult for armies to figure out who is a guerrilla fighter and who is an everyday civilian because guerrilla fighters, and this is them, I call this like the collection of men in jaunty hats, because they are all in the little fan- except for him. Um, they are all in fancy hats. But uh, guerrilla bushwhackers and, and jayhawkers don't necessarily wear uniforms. They're um, not in sort of like a formal, you know, sanctioned organization. And so it's very easy for them to kind of blend back into the populace, and it's very easy, and they know this area, they know the area of Missouri, um, and it's very easy for them to sort of blend back into, um, into that area. And so that becomes difficult to judge, you know, who is, who is fighting for, who is doing the fighting and who isn't. Jayhawkers, um, this is one here. These guys are, are mostly bushwhackers, and we'll talk about partisan rangers here in a second. Jayhawkers are basically the guerrilla fighters of Kansas, guerrilla fighters of Kansas, and um, they're sort of similar. They're these kind of they're these groups who are um, attacking bushwhackers. They mostly go at it with bushwhackers. There's not as many um, jayhawkers as there are bushwhackers, um, but bush uh, but jayhawkers are are formally unionists, and they're also unionist guerrilla fighters in other parts of um, the Western theater and into the Eastern theater as well. Um, so guerrilla warfare pops up kind of throughout the Confederacy, but it hap- in the Midwest. In this border states area, it's, mo- it's the most intense. It manifests into this, what they call this border war between Kansas and Missouri. Um, partisan rangers are slightly different. So partisan rangers are formally recognized. They become formally recognized by the Confederacy as kind of like a, um, an additional sort of um, unit um, that, that will fight for, uh, for the Confederacy and is formally recognized um, by the government there. They kind of have uniforms a, a little bit, um, and they're sort of much more regulated and much more kind of organized um, than a lot of bushwhackers um, tend to be, although bushwhackers can be pretty, pretty organized when they're making these attacks. So the bushwhacker um, methodology of irregular warfare, um, which is, you know, sacking towns, um, and uh, things like that, um, these kind of become, in some ways, they become linked to the criminality and uh, the outlaw stuff that you'll see that becomes iconic in the Wild West. Like, how many of you have seen Western movies? Mostly everybody here has seen Western movies. We're all raising our hands. I love Westerns, um, probably more than I should, but I do. 
Um, <laughs> Cause they can be kind of corny sometimes, but I do like Western movies. And so those, you know, these sort of like Western outlaw figures, they kind of come straight out of uh, this, these bushwhacker characters because I mean, look, they're all, you know, um, this guy's name is William Bloody Bill Anderson. Um, they also have dashing names, right? Well, I don't know how dashing Bloody Bill actually, it's not really dashing or romantic, but it is sort of at least flashy. Um, and this is, um, see, now I'm blanking on the names. <laughs> so this is um, William Quantrill. And this guy is probably one of the most famous of uh, bushwhackers. Um, can anybody maybe guess who that might be? It's Missouri, 19th century. It's not people I was going to guess. <laughs> Not Davy Crockett. No, it's not Davy Crockett. But that's, a, that's an interesting guess. It's an interesting, interesting guess. Uh, Davy Crockett sadly dies in my home state of Texas before, way before this, yeah. But, you know, good shot. Anybody want to guess? Billy the Kid. Nope, not Billy the Kid, but you're getting warm. It's like a Daniel. No, not a Daniel. <laughs> no? Train robberies. Oh, Raise your hands when you when you want to guess. <coughs> Anybody? Jesse James. Oh, <laughs> yes, uh, it's Jesse. He kind of he's a sort of a punk kid at this point. Like, I always say that in this picture, he looks like the person that's going to like shoplift from the mall. Um, <laughs> you just kind of look at his little face. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so um, Jesse James, um, he rides uh, with this sort of these bushwhackers and he becomes one himself. Uh, so does his brother Frank James. And uh, they're very much involved in this, this guerrilla warfare um, that's taking place in the border states. So the first kind of spectacular moment of the border war is uh, the sacking of Osceola, which is in Missouri. It happens in 1861, as you can see very soon after the outbreak of the Civil War. Um, they, uh, and it's, um, it's actually Jayhawkers that go and sack this town, Osceola. So... Um, this happens, this is a raid that begins uh, a Missouri State Guard, um, John, oh, W-E-I-D-E-M-E-Y-E-R, um, and 200 Missouri militiamen. Uh, but anyway, 200 Missouri militiamen um, are there to guard the town of Osceola, and they go up against um, a, sort of a, what they call, what they come to call the Kansas Brigade, which is about 2,000 men. And um, these are um, under the command of this dude with the top hat, this fella, who um, is Henry, or is James, uh, General James Henry Lane, is the one who's, who's um, leading these Kansas guys to Osceola. And they pretty much just destroy this town. Um, they leave all but about three buildings destroy. They leave about three buildings standing. There's about 800 buildings originally, and they destroy them. Uh, and they pretty they take a lot of supplies. Um, Lane is, uh, you know, anti-slavery, and supposedly about like 200 enslaved people also um, leave with them when they leave uh, the next day. So this happens September 22nd. And um, the Missouri guards who are there to guard the town, they're outnumbered. Um, so eventually they kind of, you know, they're, they're not very effective at guarding the town. And they take a lot of everything from, you know, food supplies to whatever it is that they can use. And they take that with them back into Kansas. So this is sort of the most explosive moment that's kind of considered, boom, all right, we're starting this war. Followed up um, by the Lawrence Massacre. Lawrence cannot catch a break in the Civil War era, quite frankly. Um, and this is followed up by the Lawrence Massacre. This is Lawrence, Kansas, in 1863, which is conducted by Quantrill's, um, Quantrill's Raiders. So uh, Quantrill um, 
kills about, uh, in 1863, they kill about 200 men and boys in the Unionist town of Lawrence, Kansas. And he himself says that this is largely in retaliation for what happens in Osceola um, in 1861. After that, you also get, uh, later on, you get this sort of this thing called the Centralia Massacre in 1864. Uh, this is where Anderson, Bloody Bill, um, led the, this famous massacre um, in which um, he and, and his men pulled about 24 unarmed Union soldiers off a train and executed them. So there's a lot of this back and forth. And these are, are the most the most explosive moments within the border war. But they're not, this isn't exactly how guerrilla warfare always takes shape in, in this region. Sometimes it's, you know, unionists trying to ferret out guerrillas from communities um, that devolves into, you know, men hiding, women and even uh, children defending them, trying to hide them. Um, so the war itself is kind of, you know, who's an enemy and who is not becomes a major issue. And so the Union has to kind of decide how to deal with this and how to deal with guerrillas versus partisan rangers. Yes. So Just a second. Because they were so hard to, like, identify when the Union people would come in, is, does this kind of lead into the theme, like, brother against brother? It's part of it, yeah. Um, but remember the whole like, idea of brother against brother is also kind of a way of just describing the entirety of the Civil War, right? The Confederacy is, um, is, is one brother, or like right, the South is one brother and the North is one brother, but also it's a way of describing the intimacy of the Civil War, which is, yes, it, it might part families in half, it might cut families in half, it might cut communities in half. Um, and this is something that would sort of contribute to that. And guerrilla warfare, the memory of guerrilla warfare, we've been kind of talking about memory throughout um, the entirety of, of the class. Um, guerrilla warfare develops its own memory. There are historians who study that. And um, one of the things that they write out of it is that women are also involved in this. Women will um, defend their families, defend their homes, and even defend their men if they have to. So the, the war as it develops in the border states is a really complicated sort of tricky thing to navigate, um, is, you know, especially for the Union Army, who doesn't want to kill civilians, but at the same time you have to try and figure out who's a civilian and who's a, what they call an enemy combatant. Um, and they can sometimes be the same thing. So what the Union Army early on, um, what the Union Army does early on is they make a decision that... Um, Partisan rangers are, because they are affiliated with the Confederacy and the Confederacy recognizes them, they're considered soldiers, essentially. They're treated as soldiers. So if they surrender, um, they will be made POWs. Guerrilla, guerrillas are essentially considered uh, criminals, um, and they can be shot um, right there. And so that sort of, I think, raises the tensions, ratchets up the tensions in the border states in Kansas and Missouri. Um, Later on, they adopt this, this thing that's uh, it's called General Order 11, which is another kind of famous aspect of the border war. Um, what essentially happens is that um, rural farm families had to go to areas near um, Union camps or leave the state. They actually expel people because the Union Army is like, we are done. We're, we're done, done, and we have been done for a very long time. And they basically expel people from about three counties in, in this Missouri area. Um, and that's another attempt of, uh, on their part to deal with this warfare. But it, you know, this irregular warfare can continue on, will continue on into, uh, in, in these very sort of personal moments, will continue on into the, the, even the end of the war. Um, one of the last, um, one of the last sort of battles, and well, not really a battle, but one of the last arm, armed conflict moments within the war uh, will happen up in the border states, but one of the last battles will actually happen in the border lands, right? So let us switch to the border lands. Yeah. Um, just. Well, I was just curious about the, uh, because the United States didn't recognize the South as like a formal country. Didn't they kind of, wouldn't all soldiers be seen as criminals that were fighting for the Confederacy? That's a, that's a good question. Um, whether or not all, all, all soldiers would be seen as, as criminals 
this is once again, you remember when we talked about the way that the United States has to kind of dance very carefully around not recognizing the Confederacy as a nation, seeing it as states in rebellion. But these, they also adopt these formal rules of war as well. And part of these, these more formal rules of war um, are about recognizing that soldiers are soldiers and they are allowed, you know, if they surrender, are allowed to become prisoners of war. There's other things that happen with soldiers, this thing called paroling, or it's like, I won't promise to do anything. Okay, well, fine. Um, but, yeah, they don't tend to see all soldiers as criminals. Now, after the Civil War, uh, like immediately after it, there is, of course, you know, a feeling of wanting the Confederacy to pay for this war. Right. Well, I mean, not, not pay, you know, pay in, in terms of this is, this is a thing you did. It's potentially treasonous. And somebody should pay for it. Somebody should be held accountable and responsible for it. Um, but that still, even that is, is up for debate still um, within, within the North and within people who, you know, if you think about Democrats, may not necessarily want that to happen. Um, so it's, it's a complicated kind of answer to, to a good question. Yes. Yeah. Is one of the reasons you see more of the guerrilla warfare in the West is it because it was so far kind of from D.C. and Richmond and in, in more underdeveloped states like that you have more just like guerrilla warfare instead of the big armies? Or what? why don't you see that as much? In I think that the reason that you don't see the big armies as much is because, yeah, like, Rich, remember, we're at the same time that this guerrilla warfare stuff and all of this fuzzy warfare stuff is going on, in the West, in the Eastern Theater and the Western Theater, we're still trying to, you know, the Union and Confederate armies are still trying to control this population. And, and in terms of the Eastern Theater, yeah, they're still trying to capture the flag. They're still trying to capture um, Washington, and they're still trying to capture Richmond. So that, that is a sort of, in their minds, a concentration. But you, you point to, uh, you know, David points to a very real issue for both the Confederacy and the Union. At the same time that they are fighting the big fancy battles and the big fancy armies, all of this other stuff is going on in the Trans-Mississippi Theater. And so, you know, how much you can actually pay attention to the Eastern Theater and the Trans-Mississippi and the West all at the same time, it's extremely taxing. And it has an impact on the war. Um, it has an impact on the war for the Confederacy, and it has an impact on the war for the Union. And we'll see that play out more and more and more as we start to talk about 64 and 65 and the closing of the war. But so far as the borderlands go, first we'll start with what is a borderland. Um, and a borderland is uh, ultimately a region where you have multiple uh, cultures come into contact with one another, um, but you also have, uh, you know, two, two, sometimes two or more different, like, political powers kind of vying for control over a space. And it also helps to define a borderland as a region that is around an international border, right? So in addition to the Civil War being all of the things that we've talked about, a guerrilla war and, you know, a more formalized war. The Civil War is, in a way, uh, a, what we call a transnational war, and that's very true of the borderlands. Um, the bo the U.S.-Mexico borderlands or the Southwest borderlands, there's actually two wars happening at the same time. So there's two big wars happening, one in the United States, one in Mexico. And on top of that, or in addition to that, you have um, conflict just raging along the U.S.-Mexico border between all of these different groups, um, Hispanics, Anglos, that's what they tend to, that's what uh, especially borderlands historians tend to call white Americans as Anglos, um, because they're especially light-skinned um, Mexican people tend to view themselves in the 19th century as white as well. And um, so you've got Anglos, you've got Hispanic people, of varying different kinds of descent. You've got Native Americans, you've got immigrants. So it's a real kind of like complicated social structure that is thrown into upheaval by the Civil War. 
And within the borderlands, um, especially for um, Hispanics, but also Tejanos, Tejanos is the word that um, Mexican Texans use to refer to themselves as, they're the Tejanos. Um, within this borderland region, you've got people trying to figure out which side they want to support. Do they, do they want to support the Confederacy? Do they want to support the Union? And it's not cut and dry for anybody in this war, but it's especially complicated for people within the southwest borderlands and also within Indian Territory, which is, is north of Texas. Um, you know, for, for Native Americans, every American war brings with it the, the you know, in the, in the 18th and 19th century, almost every American war brings with it this choice, right? Which side is going to offer us the opportunity to maintain our sovereignty? Which side uh, is going to offer us this, this ability to maintain our freedom as a people? And this is something that Native Americans consistently have to weigh when they are um, going to war for, for either side. So before that, we'll talk about this dude, Juan, and his middle name is pronounced Nepomuceno, Cortina. That's this guy here. So we're going to go back in time to 1859, 1861. And when I'm talking about this stuff, um, kind of be thinking about the parallels and the differences that you hear in these stories between what's happening in the southwest borderlands in Texas and in the border states up north or up n north of Texas um, in, in Kansas and Missouri. So Cortina uh, was born in northern Mexico. He is um, from a wealthy ranchero family. He's from a wealthy ranching family that owns property across uh, on both sides of what becomes the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, the U.S.-Mexico border in, the, in, in this period in the 19th century it is not going to look like the U.S.-Mexico border of today. Um, all of the security and walls and all of these other things, they don't exist yet. Um, it's the river. And the river is, more, is seen by people living in the borderlands as more of a bridge than it is a division. Um, it's, it's only after the Civil War that the people really begin to see this as like a, it's a space that should be divided and regulated. Um, so Cortina eventually comes to settle in this South Texas town called Brownsville, which if you get Texas, the shape of Texas in your mind, as I always have because I am, once again, from Texas. Um, <laughs> uh, but if you get the shape of Texas in your mind, Brownsville is sort of at the very bottom just before you get to the Gulf of Mexico, right, on the Rio Grande. Um, so what happens, uh, so uh, Juan uh, Cortina is, is an important sort of, uh, is an important member of the Tejano community in, um, in and around Brownsville. In 1859, he um, is involved in an altercation with the sheriff of Brownsville over one of his employees and um, rides, kind of escapes Brownsville back to his mother's ranch and then comes back to Brownsville um, with um, a, a sort of a group of men who, are, who come to be called the Cortinistas. And they essentially lay siege, uh, well, not lay siege, but they capture Brownsville and they, they hold it um, for, for quite some time. And this, of course, freaks out the Anglo population of Brownsville while they are um, in control of the city, um, Cortina issues these proclamations denouncing um, Anglos and then the power that Anglos are, are accruing in South Texas and um, essentially almost basically calls them vampires. In fact, that's what he sort of refers to them as, as vampires who are sort of sucking the life out of the Tejano people and their political power and their economic power. So this is... Um, from their perspective, they are fighting for Tejano rights. They are fighting to maintain Tejano culture. They're fighting to maintain um, what they view as their traditional hold on, on this land and on this, this space. From the perspective of Anglos, not so much. Um, from the perspective of Anglos, they are criminals. They're bandits. In fact, that's what they're called. They're called banditi. Um, there, there's a, if you remember the Texas, um, the, uh, the, 
if you remember the, the Texas Ordinance of Secession, they very briefly ma- mention that the United States Army is incapable of defending Anglos against Mexican banditi. That's kind of like low-key shade towards, <laughs> towards Juan Cortina. That's basically what that means. Um, and the U.S. Army is eventually brought in to deal with them. So the Texas Rangers are first sent out to deal and put down the Cortinistas. They do fight several battles. Um, the U.S. Army is also brought in. And um, Cortina eventually makes his way back across the border into Mexico. He's, he, he, wins, he doesn't win the day on the battlefield, but he wins in his ability to, frankly, stay alive. And it comes back in 1861, um, just as Texas uh, is embroiled in the Civil War, comes back in 1861 um, to um, raid along the U.S.-Mexico border in Texas. And when he does that, this dude, who's then captain, his name is Santos Benavides. And he eventually becomes one of the highest ranking um, Hispanics, Latinos in the Civil War. Uh, he's on fights for the, on the side of the Confederacy. And um, Benavides' men defeat Cortina, but Cortina goes back across the U.S. Mexico border again and becomes involved in this thing, the Franco or the, uh, the French invasion of Mexico, the Franco-Mexican War. So remember we talked about the Napoleons? Napoleon III decides, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had some territory in the Americas and we uh, essentially install a monarchy in Mexico. And that's what this is. The French invasion of Mexico um, installs uh, a monarchy in Mexico. Conservatives within Mexico help this. Um, and this happens amidst uh, a, you know, a, the, the presidency of this guy named Benito Juarez. So the Texas border, the southwest border, is involved in wars, conflicts, internal conflicts between people who are on different sides of the Union and the Confederate uh, conflict, right, the American Civil War, and also embroiled in what is both an invasion and a civil war in Mexico. So this is a really complicated place for there to be, uh, to be a conflict. Um, Cortina sides with Benito Juarez and also sides with the Union, which sounds kind of ironic considering the fact that it was a U.S.-Mexico army in 1859 that was trying to chase him out of, out of the border. But he does essentially side with the Union. Um, several Cortinistas actually fight in the Union, war, in the Union uh, army. Um, and um, he welcomes the Union army when um, they try to control smuggling on the Rio Grande. Uh, so the Rio Grande is one, of the, is one of the few places where Confederates can get cotton, at, export cotton out of the Confederacy and try to get past the blockade into, uh, to go and sell it, right? So the Union Army has to, uh, has to, to control that. And um, Cortina is very much, you know, interested in, in, in helping to, to do that. And eventually they kind of do shut it down. Um, but the Texas Gulf Coast sort of goes back and forth and back and forth uh, quite a bit through, through the Civil War. All right. So this brings us to the New Mexico campaign. So the New Mexico Territory is, like everything else, divided. Um, Oftentimes, if people have connections to Missouri through what they call the Santa Fe trade route, trail, um, they tend to be more sympathetic to the Confederacy. And um, among Tejanos in the Civil War, those that that tend to be uh, a little wealthier or may have some sort of direct connection with um, the South in some way, tend to be uh, more on the side of the Confederacy. Most Tejanos, most Latinos tend to fight on the side of the Confederacy. Total, there's about 20,000 Latinos or 20,000 people of Spanish descent um, who fight in the Civil War. Tejanos are a part of that. Um, Tejanos and Hispanos from from New Mexico, 
They're also not really like super good friends with the United States government, which took them over essentially during the Mexican War. So that's still very present in their minds. And that has an influence on which side they choose to support. And so some will support the Confederacy because of that. Uh, to go back to this, this big picture here, this is an etching of what the smuggling, cotton smuggling operation um, in the Rio Grande looks like. So bales of cotton waiting to sneak out of the river and, and be sold. Um, all right, so go back to the, the New Mexico campaign. So the New Mexico campaign, which you, got, you all are going to be reading about in, or, or are currently reading about in your book, is, a, is, is the Confederacy's interest in trying to gain control of this New Mexico territory. People within the southern part of the New Mexico territory they tend, to be, uh, they tend to favor the Confederacy and essentially break it off and declare themselves like Arizona Territory and they declare themselves for the Confederacy. Um, and then people kind of a little bit further north in New Mexico Territory um, tend to not be for, for the Confederacy. So what happens is, is that those who are supporting the Confederacy um, want uh, protection from Indian raids, um, that are happening within this region, this is what they're saying, and the Confederate Army within Texas is, is going there to sort of help this, but also what's happening is that the Confederacy is going to try and push further into the West. Because even California is split in terms of who they favor in this war. Southern California tends to be more for the Confederacy, Northern California tends to be more for the Union. So as we can see, the split of this war just goes straight into the territories. Um, Utah Territory, which is, we're in Utah right now. Um, they just say, hey, yes, Utah. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they essentially, the LDS say that they essentially want to set this out as much as humanly possible. That's, that's what they say. But, um, you know, the Union and Confederacy still tries to, t- tries to gauge which side all of these different territories are going to be on. And this, uh, this brings us, like I said, to the New Mexico campaign. Um, the New Mexico campaign doesn't last super long, but uh, what happens is that armies, uh, the army and Confederates invade um, into New Mexico, and the Union has to fight them off. Did you have a question, David? Uh, with the Franco-Mexican War, was the U.S. just so focused on the time of the Civil War, or did Lincoln have a response to France coming into Mexico? Because before that, we had like the U.S. sphere of influence and telling Europeans to keep out. And last week you talked the about Doctrine? yeah, and last week you talked about his response to possible French and British helping the Confederacy. Mm-hmm. So did he have any sort of response to this going on, or just well? Um... Yeah, I mean, they didn't like it, for sure. Uh, they would prefer France not do this. Um, but, yeah, the, the Civil War is, takes precedence at this point. Um, at the end of the Civil War, um, the United States government is, um, does, you know, does not support, of course, uh, the French. Um, they don't send people in to fight against um, the French invasion, though, because uh, they're now in the middle of Reconstruction. Um, but it is something that is sort of on their radar, but the Civil War takes so much precedence that it's difficult to really help in any way um, for them. So that's kind of what happens there. Um, but, but don't worry, the Mexicans prevail. So they win. They kick out uh, and actually execute the emperor in Mexico um, by the end of the war so, and reclaim their territory, reclaim their country. All right, so back to this 1862 New Mexico campaign. Um, so what happens is, is that uh, Confederates um, under this dude named Henry Sibley, um, Sibley is hoping to control the Santa Fe uh, Trail stagecoach route, um, which goes all the way up into, uh, into Missouri, into the Midwest. And um, his men meet a column of uh, Union soldiers, March 28th, um, in Glorietta Pass. Um, the forces 
though, uh, so they're eventually forced from the field. Um, they're short uh, of supplies by this point in time. And this is actually a pretty short-lived campaign. Um, Confederates retreat from Glorietta Pass back to Santa Fe. And at Glorietta, pa- uh, at Glorietta Pass, um, federal troops um, are finally able to turn back the Confederate invasion of the Southwest. And when, they, when the Confederates retreat back to Santa Fe, that's pretty much it for Confederates' ability to push into the Southwest and to claim territory there. Had they perhaps been able to claim territory there, they might have been able to push into California. Um, if they had been able to push into California, they might have been able to claim ports, in Cal- which would have extended much further this already very thin um, Union blockade. But they are not able to do that. Um, the Confederacy still has some imperialist notions. Uh, remember um, the Southern imperialism stuff we talked about at the beginning um, of this class of the semester um, when some of your classmates said they want it all. They want all of this. They want the West. They want Central America. They want Mexico. And those are still ideas that are a part of, of the Confederacy like in the future. But with this and what's going on in the Eastern theater as the war progresses in the East and West, those sort of grand ideas start to, start to quite frankly, fizzle out. Um, as the Confederacy is sort of fighting for its life. Um, And you can, once again, think about the connections between the border states and the border lands, um, the connections in terms of the the way that the war takes shape, the different sides of the war, the very sort of local, personal, close fighting of the war that happens in the border states and the border lands. And we'll be thinking about that as we move into uh, talking about the war in Indian territory on Thursday. So thank you all very much. This has been a good class as per usual. And um, class is missed. Okay. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.